Seven Samurai is one of the crown jewels of 1950s Japanese cinema and one of the best movies ever made. 66 years after it was released, it's still one of the great adventure films of all time. Originally, Akira Kurosawa was going to tell the story of the day of the life of a single samurai. During his historic research, he found a story on samurai protecting farmers from bandits, and that's how Seven Samurai was born. A Japanese village in the 1580s is besieged by bandits. The villagers go to the town's wise old man, who was also the town miller, and ask him what they should do. Find samurai to protect the village, masterless samurai, he says. But the villagers have no money to pay for protection. Find hungry samurai, the old man tells them. And leaving the village, they do find the samurai. Shimura Takashi as Kambei, a war-weary but honourable and strategic genius of a ronin. Gorobe, played by Yoshio Inaba, a skilled archer who acts as Kambei's second-in-command and helps create the master plan for the village's defence. Kato Daisuke as Shichiroji, Kambei's old friend and his former lieutenant. Miyaguchi Seiji as Kyuzu, a serious, stone-faced and very skilled swordsman. Chiaki Minoru as Heihachi, a friendly and less skilled fighter who's charming and witty and keeps his comrades' morale up in the face of adversity. Kimura Asao as Kazushiro, the untested son of a wealthy landowner samurai whom Kambei reluctantly takes on as a disciple. Then we get the interesting one, Mifune Toshiro's Kigochio, a humorous, mercurial and temperamental rogue who lies about being a samurai but eventually he proves he's worthwhile and is resourceful. Originally there were going to be six samurai but Kurosawa decided the six staunch samurai would be a bit boring. He needed a loose cannon. Originally Mifune was going to play the stoic Kyozo but Kurosawa who'd worked with Mifune before gave the actor the freedom to improvise the character a wild, almost bestial outsider who, though not a samurai, becomes one during the events of the movie. Akira Kurosawa went to incredible lengths to give a lived-in feel to his movie. He wrote dossiers for every character with a speaking role in the film, including what they wore, what their favourite foods were, their past history, their speaking habits, their reaction to the battles and any other details he could think of. He had a registry of all 101 residents of the village, creating a family tree to help his extras build their characters and the relationships between them. The movie took over a year to film, and Toho Studios closed production twice because of the cost overruns. When they did that, Kurosawa just went fishing because he knew that they'd invested so much money in the film that, that they'd eventually come back to him and get him to start up again, and he was right. So many of the things we take for granted in action films started with Seven Samurai. The montage of getting the gang together, the romance between the youngest member of the team and a local, reluctant heroes, and the idea of introducing the main protagonist in an early sequence unrelated to the main plot were all things that Kurosawa put together in an action film for the first time. The attention to detail in this meticulously mounted production helped make the three-hour runtime of Seven Samurai seem brief. This is an amazing piece of cinema, an immersive and unforgettable experience. It's the original gangster of the modern action film. Seven Samurai is the fast charger for your love of movies. When you're feeling a bit jaded, you watch Seven Samurai and your batteries go back to 100%. Of course, the Americans were going to remake it. That brings us to six years later, when actor Yul Brynner, with the assistance of another actor, Anthony Quinn, who sued him for Welshing on the deal, went to produce a Walter Mirisch with the idea of a Western remake of Seven Samurai. Director John Sturgis was brought on board. He was Hollywood's master of widescreen action cinema at the time, having directed Gunfight at the OK Corral and Bad Day at Blackrock successfully. Casting was going to be crucial. Brenner played Chris, the Kambe of the group, who recruits the others. He was an established star at the time. Steve McQueen was already popular on TV for his Western series Wanted Dead or Alive. He faked whiplash from a car accident so he could skip out on the TV gig and play Vin, the second in command to Chris. We deal in lead, friend. Charles Bronson also had a successful TV series Man with a Camera at the time. 
He was brought on to play Bernardo O'Reilly, the half-Irish, half-Mexican gunfighter who chopped wood like Heihachi did in Seven Samurai, but had Kikuchio's affinity for children. Robert Vaughan had done some TV and a Roger Corman movie called Teenage Caveman back in the 50s. His role was Lee, the southern gunman suffering from what we now call PTSD. Robert Vaughan suggested an acting buddy of his, James Coburn, for the role of Brit, the knife expert. Coburn had seen Seven Samurai a dozen times and had a good solid handle on his character, who paralleled cues of the austere aesthetic samurai. Brad Dexter, a character actor who once saved Frank Sinatra from drowning in Hawaii, came on board as Harry Luck, the money-hungry friend of Chris's. And as the young, hot-headed gunman Chico, they found a young German actor, Horst Buchholz, who was known as the German James Dean. For the villain Calvera, there was New York actor Eli Wallach, who reached critical acclaim as the lecherous Vicaro in the silly movie adaptation of Tennessee Williams' Baby Doll. The Magnificent Seven was filmed in Cuernavaca, Mexico, and at Churubusco Studios in Mexico City, giving it the right flavour for a story about bandits, villagers and gunslingers. Add to that Elmer Bernstein's iconic film music, and you had a box office winner. The adaptation works well. It's not as textured and nuanced as Kurosawa's original work, but it still has an iconic status in cinema, and it has that primary virtue of any film, rewatchability. The Magnificent Seven spawned three sequels, Return of the Seven in 1966, Guns of the Magnificent Seven in 1969, and The Magnificent Seven Ride in 1972. There was also a 1998-2000 to TV series, but none of those were particularly successful. I'm not a fan of the Anton Fuqua-directed remake of Magnificent Seven from 2016. For me, it just didn't work. That brings us to the third and least of the iterations of our iconic heroes, the Roger Corman-produced 1980 movie Battle Beyond the Stars. Made for $2 million in a leaky, disused timber yard in Los Angeles, this is the ugly child version of the story, which, in spite of its fugliness, I kind of like. Right from the start, I have to say that I don't like James Horner's music in this one. I don't know why, I just don't. I've never really liked Horner's music in any movie. I do like John Sale's script. Sales had worked for Corman before on Piranha and The Lady in Red, and he went on to make some really fine movies of his own, the best of which for me is Lone Star. A modern-day western looks back at the legacy of the past and in a really interesting way. Battle Beyond the Stars gives us the planet Akira and the citizens of that planet, the Akira, named for Kurosawa, obviously. Basically, they're a bunch of bland, blonde, white people in beige tunics living peacefully on the planet, following a vaguely Buddhist philosophy called the Vada, which may have been a nod to French film director Agnes Vada. Instead of bandits, we get John Saxon's Sador of the Malmori, a genocidal despot with a comb-over hairstyle and a spaceship full of mutants. Sador is kept alive by constantly transplanting body parts from other people onto himself, and he has a very strong weapon, a thing called a stellar converter, a bloody big ray gun that turns planets into small stars. The villagers sent to find mercenaries to help Akira is Shad, a farmer played by Richard Thomas, who was in a bland American TV series in the 70s called The Waltons, which I never watched. Shed gets sent off to find mercenaries by Jeff Corey's Zed the Corsair, and to get there he has Zed's voluptuously designed spaceship Nell. Nell, the sassy and sardonic spaceship, is voiced by an actor called Lynn Carlin, who was brilliant in John Cassavetti's faces in the 1960s. Shad finds Cowboy, played by George Papad, an alcoholic smuggler from an obscure planet called Earth. I'm from Earth. Know where that is? He finds Gelt, played by Robert Vaughan, a character not entirely unlike the role he played in The Magnificent Seven. Next up, he finds Nestor, a group mind of five clones, the spokes clone of whom was played by Earl Bowen, who later showed up in the Terminator series. The next ally he finds is Cayman of the Lambda Zone, reptilian slaver played by Morgan Shepard. He also finds the Kelvin, a short race that communicates by modulating waves of heat radiating from their bodies. The mandatory love interest is Darlene Flugel's Nanelia, a systems expert and the daughter of Dr. Hephaestus, played by character director Sam Jaffe. Finally, we have St. X-Men of the Valkyrie, played by Sybil Denning, a sexually adventurous warrior woman who longs to die in battle. I would lay down cash to see a remake of Battle Beyond the Stars. It was silly, 
wonderful fun with very basic special effects which were designed and created by a guy called James Cameron. Dodgy sets and a bland league character, but somehow it works. It's one of Corman's most financially successful movies of the 1980s. While it's nowhere near as profoundly wonderful as Seven Samurai or as charismatically kinetic as The Magnificent Seven, there's a grassroots gutsiness about Battle Beyond the Stars that gives it a place in my heart. There have been other adaptations of Seven Samurai, the steampunk anime series Samurai 7, the sword and sandal flick The Seven Magnificent Gladiators, a 1970 American-Iranian co-production action film called The Invincible Six, Here's my tip. Watch the original, then go through the remakes and iterations at your own pace. It's a satisfying and rewarding cinematic journey, so take the ride. Enjoy the movies. Definitely check out the first one first. Thank you for watching. I'll be back next week with another video. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe and hit the like button and the notification bell. And I'll see you next time.